Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcy Wheeler. I'm happy to be with you here at Netroots Nation. You know, after the Packers won the Super Bowl, it has been so sleepy and quiet in Wisconsin. I thought I'd come over to Minnesota and see what was going on. I am eternally grateful to all of you for the connections that we have made and the work that we've already done together. Your outreach to us, my own staff's outreach to you over the years has been tremendous. And I thank you for your support in all of my efforts. But more importantly, you, this group, has single-mindedly pursued the truth about complicated but critically important issues. And you've brought that truth to a larger audience. You embody the spirit and the purpose of the Netroots. For nearly a decade now, the progressive Netroots have served as a check, not only on our politicians, both Republican and Democratic, but also on those who are supposed to play that role, namely the media. Prior to your appearance, and I know it well, there really wasn't a meaningful, ongoing examination of the inadequacies of our traditional media. Now, thanks to you, there is. And I highlight that because we have never needed independent checks on our public institutions more. We are at the brink of two alternative paths, a fork in the road, if you will. The first path marks the beginning of the complete destruction of our campaign finance system and the total corporate domination of our political process. It leads to an era marked by increasing corporate dominance of our most fundamental democratic institutions, those that govern us, that write and enforce our laws and regulations, those that oversee our economy and our relations with other countries, and even our national security. So that's one path. But the second path before us marks what could become a wake-up call, where the public finally says, enough, we're not going to let corporations dominate this. We're going to start turning this around, and we're going to start turning it around right now. That is the path. I formed Progressives United precisely because we need to take this second path. And today I ask for your help to ensure that our nation takes that second path. In fact, we can't do it without your help. I hope I don't exaggerate when I say that the future of our, our democracy depends on it. Now, when I talk about this, I like to refer to this topic as, sort of oddly, Republican and Democrat toothpaste, Citizens United and its implications. I'll explain what that means later, but the 2010 Supreme Court decision in Citizens United is at the center of this discussion. Many of you know the case. It was a five to four decision, opinion written by Justice Kennedy. I want to point out here that Justice Stevens wrote the dissent. He was not happy with the majority, and it was his last time to ever announce a decision. At age 90, he wrote an almost 90-page dissent, and he sat up there and made the other justices listen for about 25 minutes to what he had to say, which is very rare in the Supreme Court. It isn't really done in the Supreme Court. But Justice Stevens did it, and I was so proud of that great justice, originally from Chicago and appointed by a Republican president. He had to, the guts to call this decision out for what it was. But sadly, he was in the minority. The decision issued by the court's majority, my friends, was essentially a lawless decision, not only because of the substance of it, which gave corporations free reign over our political process that is so fundamental to our democracy, but also it gave a complete disregard for legal rules. You know, the Supreme Court's supposed to find a narrow basis for a decision if they can. They had a bunch of other ways they could have resolved that case in a very narrow way, but they decided to go for broke. And as we used to hear from conservatives, these courts are not supposed to legislate, right? They're not supposed to be activists. Well, Citizens United was a completely activist decision. As I said, it initially had to do with a narrow matter having to do with a movie about Hillary Clinton, but the ultimate decision handed down wasn't about that at all. The decision overturned 
over 100 years of both statutes and case law in a way that I have never seen. And the historical parallels here are eye-opening. A little over a century ago, we faced the same fundamental choice that we have today, the one I mentioned before. After decades of living through what Mark Twain called the Gilded Age, the country rejected the dominance of moneyed interest and embraced the path of reform that led to the Progressive Era. The Progressive Era was the country's clear and emphatic reaction to the Gilded Age. It produced landmark reforms that are still with us. Today, I think few people would question that legacy, and it was the Progressive Era that produced the famous Sherman Antitrust Act, which is still the fundamental antitrust law in this country, one of the first times we ever really put the brakes on corporate dominance in this country. But there were also other fundamental reforms. One I kind of liked over the years, the direct election of senators, instead of having legislatures choose them. And one of those was Fighting Bob LaFollette, the great progressive from Wisconsin. And progressives like LaFollette knew that if corporations could use their treasuries, the money that comes in from you, the money we pay them to buy our stuff to influence elections, they could get a stranglehold in our political process. So long ago, in 1907, President Teddy Roosevelt signed into law another progressive era reform, the Tillman Act. And it prohibited corporations from using funds from their general treasuries to participate in political campaigns. Then 40 years later, Unions started to rise, and people said, all right, if corporations have to do it, unions have to do it too. So under the Taft-Hartley law, unions were similarly prohibited from using funds from their general treasuries for political campaigns. Now, the Tillman Act was the law of the land for more than 100 years, and similar restrictions on unions have been the law for 60 years, and case after case after case confirmed that this was an appropriate statute, that these were appropriate statutes, and that it was the law of the land. When I entered politics, I never heard anyone say or even suggest that somehow these laws weren't valid until the Supreme Court made this decision. Of course, these laws from that era did not address all of our problems in our system. Trying to fix our campaign finance system is a permanent job. They shouldn't be seen as permanent fixes at any point. There's always going to be loopholes. Thomas Jefferson said that there ought to be a revolution every 20 years. Surely there can be a campaign finance reform every 20 years. So even when the Tillman and Taft-Hartley restrictions arose, we had more problems. I, I'm told that before I got to the Senate in the Senate cloakroom, once in a while there would be a briefcase full of $100 bills that would show up and be distributed around. There weren't any rule, rules governing any of that. So in the 1970s, as a reaction to these kinds of abuses, Congress enacted the Federal Election Campaign Act and then amended it several times. And uh, it was in part because of the Watergate scandal. As there was after the enactment of McCain-Feingold, there were litigations challenging this. But in Buckley v. Vallejo, the court kind of split the difference. The court said you can limit contributions to a campaign, but you can't limit spending. And this is where the very unfortunate notion of money is speech came from. This is a disturbing doctrine. And it's hard to maintain that conclusion in the face of the exception made by the court that permitted restrictions on contributions that would either create corruption or an appearance of corruption. Let me note here that speech doesn't corrupt. Money corrupts. And money isn't speech. Now, I'm not going to try to tell you that the post-Buckley era was a pretty one, better than the crazy lawless system we're in now, but members of Congress and Candidates for the Senate and the House spent way too much time raising money. The expression dialing for dollars, you've all heard of it. It was embarrassing. I remember running into one of my colleagues who's still in the Senate, actually, after a, coming back from the Midwest one night. We ran into each other at National Airport, 11 o'clock at night, and he looked just exhausted. And he had, been, had a big amendment on the floor the next day. And I said, what, what's wrong? What's going on? And he said, I had four fundraisers today, just on his way back from his state. But sadly, it got even worse in the 1990s when Bill Clinton and Al Gore and their lawyers realized how they could exploit a loophole in the campaign finance laws by creating something called soft money. These were larger unlimited contributions that were supposed to be allowed only for get-out-the-vote operations, but the Clinton-Gore folks maintained that it could be used for political parties for so-called issue ads. You remember this. As long as the TV ads didn't say elect or re-elect or vote for or vote against, 
they were pretty much free to say whatever they wanted. For example, an ad could say, Russ Feingold votes against the environment, blah, 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 call his office and tell him he's a dirty dog. That kind of ad was considered an issue ad, and it was an enormous sieve through which soft money flowed. So we realized we had to do something about this process. I began to see the corruption on the floor of the Senate itself when these, could be, these dollars could be used for campaign ads. I remember going down to the well of the Senate and hearing a couple of senators talking to each other. One of them, a Democrat from Louisiana, was talking to a Republican, and the Republican senator said, AT&T gave us over $100,000 for our Republican dinner the other night. And I heard the Democratic senator say, oh, yeah, they gave us $100,000 for a table, too. They bought a table for our dinner, too. Isn't that nice? These dinners were on two consecutive nights, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then we voted on the issue on Thursday. The same senator from Louisiana, after he got a little bit tired of all my amendments for gift ban of members of Congress and all these rules, finally came up to me one day, and he's a bigger guy than me, and put his arm around me, and he said, Russ, sounds like you guys in Wisconsin, you all don't have so much fun down up there. I mean, we don't have as much fun as Louisiana, but we sure don't like corruption in politics. I remember another occasion when Ted Kennedy and Paul Simon and I were fighting legislation allowing the FedEx Corporation to avoid being subject to stronger collective bargaining rules. When the Democratic whip, one of the very top leadership people in the Democratic Party, came up to me in the cloakroom and put his arm around me and said, Russ, are you aware that FedEx gave us $100,000 last year? I couldn't believe it. If you don't believe me in this story, it's in the official record of the case that upheld McCain-Feingold. It's in the record as evidence. Soft money created what was obviously a transactional situation. Members of Congress could raise it. Members could call people up and say, give us 100000 give us 500000 give us a million. It was transactional, it was corrupting, and it paid off for corporations big time. Whether it be NAFTA or GATT, our most permanent nation status for China, these were all supported by people like Clinton and Gore and Gingrich and Dole because all of them were benefiting through their parties by these huge corporate contributions. I don't need to tell this group about the other examples. The Telecommunications Act of 1996, one of the most corrupt laws ever passed in this country, was a result of this soft money and destroyed uh, the ability of independence in the media until you folks came along. You're the ones that helped rescue us from this. The bankruptcy bill. Paul Wellstone, that wonderful senator from this state and I, we fought that bill year after year, which crushed consumers' opportunities to get out of bankruptcy. And I know we all admire Elizabeth Warren now, but, you know, she was in the trenches fighting on that every single day to help us prevent that from becoming a law. The series of measures for the financial industry that eliminated the common sense and time-tested protections of the Glass-Steagall Act were in part a result of the soft money contributions. The irresponsible tax and budget policies of the last decade that turned trillions into projected debt reduction into trillions more in additional debt, these were all part of this legacy. So the legacy of soft money was horrific. And McCain-Feingold successfully eliminated soft money being given to the parties. So I find it a little ironic when people come up to me and say, how do you feel about McCain-Feingold being overturned. It wasn't. And sadly, it's the only thing that hasn't been. McCain-Feingold was built on the foundation of the idea that corporations couldn't do directly what they tried to do indirectly through soft money. So this was a complete end run around what we tried to do in McCain-Feingold. And some parts of it have been chipped away. We had a provision that people, uh, kids couldn't give campaign contributions. We had nine-month-olds giving contributions, very precocious children from wealthy families. Well, the court struck that down, and maybe they are right about that. But the good news is the overall bill is still there. And then we had a couple of elections before Citizens United, after we banned SAF money, and things went pretty well in 2006 and 2008. Many people were furious that the political parties could no longer raise these huge contributions. And they were fuming when Barack Obama showed that one could raise a whole bunch of money from a lot of people without depending on those half-million-dollar contributions. And, of course, they didn't like the results of those elections. It wasn't just that we had won. 
It was that millions of people became totally engaged and excited about the political process. Ten and twenty dollar contributions, much of it raised through the internet from people who had never given money, notably from young people. I started seeing five and ten dollar contributions from college students that I'd never seen before because they felt welcome to the process and a part of it, a part of the political process. So in the wake of the 2000 election, I was feeling pretty good about the direction the process was going. There were still issues, and there was more to be done, such as establishing a public financing system for congressional campaigns and updating and strengthening the presidential public financing system, abolishing the absolutely worthless Federal Elections Commission, and replacing it with meaningful enforcement. And these things all seemed within reach. Then the court issued its decision in Citizens United. And all hell broke loose. Let me say that if you scrape away all the legal tactics and the rhetoric around Citizens United and examine the real motives behind it, what was really going on here is that the corporate-funded, right-leaning elements in this country were rocked. They were rocked by the power of the Internet and mass personal involvement by average citizens. Corporate power in this America saw the face of democracy and they were terrified. They were terrified. They saw millions being able to participate for very little. And at a moment's notice, thousands could be called to come on down to the state capitol or come over to this event here or meet up over here. They were scared stiff that we'd stop the soft money flow, the leverage on which they were lied to get both Republicans, and I'm sorry to say, too many Democrats to continue to ratify job-killing trade agreements, to enact the Wall Street wish list of financial deregulation, even under the Obama administration, failing to adequately regulate Wall Street in the so-called repair bill and pass the most fiscally irresponsible tax and budget policies in our lifetime. The court's lawless decision in Citizens United is so extreme that unless we do something to stop it, unless we take that second path, our nation will return to that gilded age, only this time it will be the gilded age on steroids. Now we're getting a taste, but only a taste, of what awaits us. In Wisconsin, the Koch brothers and their corporate siblings have been starting to fill out their wish list. The governor they helped put in office, Scott Walker, has been systematically eliminating the collective bargaining rights of our public workers that they have had for decades. In Washington, we've seen the House Republicans brazenly propose their corporate budget and go after seniors and those with disabilities. But as we all know, this is really just the beginning. If we're to avoid a second Gilded Age, we need to enact a number of critical reforms, and we're going to have to do that in the face of corporate power fully unleashed by Citizens United. So this has been my principal concern since the election last November and the reason that I formed with others Progressives United. And it gets to this thing I promised to mention, Republican and Democrat toothpaste. What does it mean? What it means is if this is the way it's going to be, if corporations are going to take the money that we use to buy the stuff we need, well, I don't want to buy from Republican corporations. I want to buy from Democrat. In fact, I want to buy from progressive corporations. I want to buy Democrat toothpaste. I want to buy progressive toothpaste, not Republican toothpaste. Same thing with detergent. What about gasoline? How do you feel knowing that for the first time now, when you go down and buy a 4 or $5 gallon of gasoline, that company can now take that money and immediately use it to try to destroy the rights of working people in an election by using the money for actual candidates. You're paying for that right out of your pocket. We even have a controversy about this in Wisconsin concerning, yes, bratwurst. We have the largest brat festival in the world, okay? It's on Memorial Day every year in Madison. But one of the companies that gives charitably some several hundred thousand bratwurst for this event, Johnsonville Bratz, is a big supporter of Governor Walker and some of these conservative elements. So people formed three different alternative brat fests this past Memorial weekend. That's the direction things are going to go 
if we don't change this ridiculous ruling. We're going to even need Republican and Democrat cheeseheads in Wisconsin, and that's going to be a real problem. You know, a company here in this state found out about the problems with doing this. A company called Target. Target said, oh, I think we'll give $150,000 to a candidate who were a candidate for governor over here was not being very nice on gay lesbian issues. And they made Lady Gaga mad, <laughs> which is a mistake. And they were called out on this. And they were forced to back off. Because these folks, if they can be exposed and we can disclose that they're doing this, will be afraid of the economic consequences that they will face. But we cannot. So if we have to go down that road, we will. But in the meantime, to me, the most important thing is we simply have to overturn Citizen United. That's not an impossible task. One vote. The decision was five to four. And everybody always says to me, but who's going to leave? You know, the, the ones that are likely to vote the right way might leave before the Republicans. Look, that is a decision that is out of my hands. Other forces decide that. But we have to be ready. We have a president right now, and I hope he will be reelected, who is likely to appoint someone who will give a fair hearing to this case, who won't decide in advance. We can get that vote. We can overturn Citizens United. We can put this genie back in the bottle, just as the progressives did in the Gilded Age. So that has got to be our top priority. But to get there, the issue of corporate influence in these campaigns has to be front and center. I would urge President Obama, as he campaigns on issues from the economy to national security, to put at that same high level, at the center of his campaign, the need to overturn Citizens United and stop corporate dominance of our politics. Shouldn't be checking a box. Shouldn't be checking a box. It should be in every speech, every statement. It is the bottom line for our democracy. It has to be our campaign next year. We have to pass the Disclose Act in the Congress that would at least force these interests to admit that they're putting out this kind of money. You remember when we tried to pass McCain-Feingold, Mitch McConnell would get up and he'd say, now, uh, we can't have these laws about soft money. All we need is disclosure. Well, sure enough, when he had a chance to vote for disclosure, he didn't do it. And Al Franken, your great senator in this state, tells a story that he walked up in that same well of the Senate and he said, Senator McConnell, could I ask you a question? Why is it that when you were against McCain-Feingold, you were for disclosure, but you just voted this way now? And I guess McConnell just ran away, which is a good thing to do when Al's got a hold of you. We have to call out everybody who is moving in the wrong direction on this. It's not just about campaigns and contributions. We had to say to the president, Mr. President, Jeff Imelt is not the right guy. The CEO of GE is not the right guy to be running your jobs and competitive council. Not when your company doubled its profits, increased his compensation, and asked its workers to take huge pay and benefit cuts. That's not the way to go. We also have to support the president when he's about to make a gutsy move, which he has said he will do, which is to issue an executive order that says that he's going to make sure the corporations that want government contracts have to tell us what campaign contributions they've made. We should support him in that. And yes, we should call out, and we did call out, both Republicans and Democrats who tried to stop it, whether they're Democrat senators or not. They have no business fighting the president's effort to expose this corporate corruption. And sometimes we have to be very direct with the Democratic Party itself. And just as you've long pushed our Democrats to stand up for their ideals, I'm here this evening to ask you to redouble your efforts, because I fear that the Democratic Party is in danger of losing its identity. The most recent example is a new Democrat organization, a super PAC, Priorities USA, that will allow Democratic consultants to take and spend unlimited amounts of undisclosed corporate money 
to try to influence next year's election. Creating those kind of super PACs for Democrats is wrong. It is not something we should do. I disagree. I think it's a mistake for us to take the argument that they like to make as well. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to take the corporate money like the Republicans do, and then after we win, we'll change it. When's the last time anyone did that? Most people don't change the rules after they win by them. It doesn't usually happen, almost never happens. And you know what? I think we'll lose anyway if we do this. We'll lose our soul when it comes to the issue of corporate domination. People will see us as weak. People will see us as corporate light. It will gut our message. I think it's not just wrong. I think it's a dumb strategy. It's dumb because people will not believe us if we do this. So I strongly disagree with those who are trying to create these PACs. I know people want to win. I understand that. I like to win, too. And I know that today's Republican Party has found more ways to play dirty. So I empathize with the desire to fight fire with fire. But Democrats should just never be in the business of taking unlimited corporate contributions. It's dancing with the devil. And it's a game that we will never win. We will not win. People will see us as weak and unprincipled. They will see us as corporate light. And in the end, our strength, as you know better than anybody, is people power. We can raise that money from small contributions, and we can win without selling our soul. This distinction is crucial. It's not enough to put a D next to your name and call yourself a Democrat. So together, together, we can stand up to corporate influence in American politics. Together, we can call out the Democratic Party when it strays from its ideals. And together, we can take back our government. Thank you for having me here tonight.